Welcome to the Brain Matters webinar. I'm Dick Moberg, your host for today's presentation. Our featured panelist is Dr. Brandon Foreman, and our featured industry partner is Rao Maddock. We'll first review a few upcoming meetings, some abstract deadlines, and a recent publication. We'll then hear a recorded presentation from Dr. Foreman, followed by a few slides from our industry partner. At the end, we'll have a live Q&A session with Dr. Foreman. So please type in your questions using the Q&A tab on your screen anytime during the presentation. Now let's look at some upcoming meetings. All of these meetings are listed in the events section on our website, www.moberg.com. The International Congress on Clinical Neurophysiology is coming up soon. This is a combined meeting of the American, Canadian, and international EEG societies. And speaking of combinations, we'll be exhibiting next to one of the latest data integration partners, Micromed. We'll be showing how their epilepsy EEG data and our ICU data flow into a common file manager and data management system. Next is the Pediatric Academic Society meeting in Toronto. They have some good sessions and posters on neonatal brain monitoring. We'll show another new interface to the Nanan SenseMart system. Also in May, we have the Mayo Clinic Workshop in Orlando and the Arrowhead TBI meeting in Washington. The Neurotrauma meeting will be in August in Toronto and held in conjunction with the International Society. And of course, in September, we have the ICSD meeting, the Spreading Depolarization meeting, which will be a satellite meeting this year just prior to the Neurocritical Care Society. We added a new section this time. We thought it'd be helpful to list the upcoming abstract deadlines. In April, that's on, on April 22nd, that's on Monday, the neurotrauma abstracts are due, so get busy over the weekend. April 30th, the abstracts for SNAC are due. May 1st, the neonatal nurses meeting. May 15th, neurocritical care society abstracts. June 15th, the spreading depolarization meeting abstract are due. And June 30th, Euro neuro. We decided to feature just one publication this time. It's one that will be published in Brain, but available now ahead of print. It's from Jens Dreyer's group in Berlin and focuses on ultra slow potentials as seen in spreading depolarizations and their correlation with infarcts. Their data states that these negative ultra slow potentials are the electrophysiological correlate of infarction in human brain and a neuromonitoring detected medical emergency. So very cool stuff. This is a good time to remind you about our newsletter, the Neuroscience Monitor, which will keep you up to date in neuromonitoring. Your colleagues can sign up anytime on our website. If you have an event or news item related to neuromonitoring and neurocritical care, please send it to us. By this time, I hope everyone has figured out how to get onto the webinar and you have your cup of coffee next to you. So uh, let's move on to our featured panelists. Today's panelist is Dr. Brandon Foreman at the University of Cincinnati. And we had a fun time traveling to Cincinnati to film this segment. So let's roll the video. Hi, I'm Dick Moberg and we're in beautiful downtown Cincinnati to film this month's uh, webinar. Uh, if you look up Cincinnati in Wikipedia, it says it's the Paris of the US, at least it was in the 1800s. And they say that because of the beautiful architecture here in Cincinnati and this building behind me is the music hall. And it's one of the examples of the architecture back in the 1800s that looks like Paris. I'm here with Anna Rodriguez, our Hello. director of research. And uh, she and I will be talking to Dr. Brandon Foreman at the University of Cincinnati. Hi, I'm Brandon Foreman. I'm an assistant professor with the Department of Neurology and Rehabilitation Medicine here at the University of Cincinnati Medical Center, which you can see behind me. Uh, University of Cincinnati Medical Center is a 770 bed tertiary care facility here. We've got a 20 bed neuro ICU with advanced neuro monitoring capabilities, staffed by emergency medicine, internal medicine, and neurology trained intensivists. So, why don't we go inside and we'll talk a little bit about the neuro monitor? All right, well, we'll go ahead and get started then. So, um, what I'm going to talk about is uh, for this segment is interpreting and reporting the multimodal neuromonitoring data and really focusing on the idea of capturing that data and putting it into the medical record as really a medical record of the brain. Uh, and so our objectives for, for this, uh, this segment are one, to just describe the rationale and the approach to multimodality monitoring really with a focus on intracranial neuromonitoring. Uh, 
Um, we're going to explore a practical approach to interpreting and interacting with this intracranial multimodality monitoring data using the CNS reader, uh, how you can integrate things using a, a platform that'll allow you to, to interact with the data, and then being able to put that data together into some form of standardized format is critical to communicating with both your medical record system as well as your clinical team taking care of the patients. So I'm going to start by actually talking about the future. One of the most common questions that you get thinking about this intracranial monitoring and neuromonitoring uh, uh, data is what are we doing? Where are we headed? What, what is this going to look like in the future? And so I thought I'd start with this to kind of paint the picture of what uh, neuromonitoring is going to look like in the future. And then we can kind of talk about how we get there from here. So in the future, ideally a single minimally invasive device would be deployed at the bedside. And then multiple streams of physiologic data would then wirelessly connect to some bedside display. Uh, summary data then would automatically populate the EMR at predefined intervals. And then you'd have some kind of an artificial intelligence algorithm that would look at that data for you and send a message to the clinical team, warning of some change in the physiologic environment, suggesting a potential problem delayed cerebral ischemia, increasing cerebral edema with loss of autoregulation, uh, increasingly prolonged depolarizations. But this isn't just some Philip K. Dick story. The future is already here in many ways. We just have to define it. What to integrate, how to summarize it. Those tools are now available. And so really it's up to you. And that's what I'm gonna be discussing in this webinar. So let's start with a big problem, which is that most of our disease processes are not defined in terms of the physiology that we record. Take traumatic brain injury as an example. Trials targeting common physiologic targets, usually intracranial pressure, have failed. And it's no wonder, because the physiology after TBI really includes not just pressure, but autoregulation and metabolism and flow-coupled functioning. And it's increasingly acknowledge that system, uh, systemic targets, such as blood pressure, are more complex than we give them credit for. And so consequently, our, our guidelines, the Brain Trauma Foundation guidelines in this case, have no level one or two A evidence or recommendations for any physiologic thresholds or their measurement. And so multimodality monitoring then becomes this elephant in the room. We all know we should do it intuitively, but we tend to focus on single components of an incredibly dynamic and highly regulated organ. Uh, we focus on pressure dynamics because they're relatively easy to measure. But are they important? Are they merely an epiphenomenon of some in-process? And importantly, we don't integrate data in any meaningful way at the bedside in most situations. Physiologic states, for instance, the elephant here in this case, are not well recognized and more work is needed to understand the complexity of what we're seeing. Uh, Dr. Balu's decision tree, the last webinar, if you haven't seen it, I highly recommend it. It gives you a glimpse of this. The human brain is not meant to interact with multiple independent variables, but we can begin to put these pieces together in an actionable way if we can integrate the data and approach it systematically. So the first thing to do is be systematic about who actually gets intracranial advanced multimodality neuromonitoring. And so creating this approach uh, recognizes that you, you can't just do this haphazardly. Patient selection is really critical to beginning to make inferences about what you're seeing. So what we did at our shop is to create a neuromonitoring protocol. And this should be done anywhere you're doing intracranial neuromonitoring. We wanted to really focus on the sickest patients, those whose neuro exam really precludes you from making inferences about how your patient is doing. You need more data. And those are the patients we wanted to target. Patients in our case who can't follow commands reliably, who can't open their eyes spontaneously. Those patients with diffuse brain injuries such as trauma and subarachnoid hemorrhage are the, the patients we decided to focus on. And when you have a patient who earns that level two or three protocol, that protocol that says we want to intracranially monitor the brain, for our shop we uh, include a variety of parameters that allow us to make inferences about their brain physiology beyond just intracranial pressure. So what we use here uh, is a quad lumen bolt um, that screws directly into the skull and includes three different probes which allow us to measure not only intracranial pressure, but brain tissue oxygen, brain temperature, cerebral blood flow, and cortical potentials, the depth EEG, uh, an array of eight electrodes that uh, sits within the cortex. So one question that comes up when you uh, have an approach like this, when you are talking about putting multiple probes in someone who's had an acute brain injury is, is it safe? And so 
what we found looking over the two years of our experience at UC is that putting in this form of monitoring in patients early after an acute traumatic brain injury in this case, and monitoring people for uh, a period of around five days, only resulted in our case in one hemorrhage that expanded but was non-significant and did not impact outcome. And this is similar to what Dr. Ballou expressed in, in his uh, ex institution's experience and what's been published from other centers uh, doing this form of monitoring. So relative to other uh, invasive monitoring such as uh, external ventricular drains, this ends up being a very, very safe technique to monitor. So now that you've got these monitors in place, how do you approach the data? What do you do with this multimodality monitoring data? And so by integrating all of this data, uh, you need to have a framework in which to, to start uh, thinking about it. And so the way I think about it is in terms of the mechanics of what you're measuring. So pressure, flow, the metabolism of the brain, uh, the delivery of oxygen and glucose, and the function ultimately of the brain tissue that is receiving that pressure, flow, and, and metabolic rate of oxygen. And so uh, going through each one of those parameters, I think, gives you a sense for what you have to capture, what you have to integrate when you start looking at the data. Intracranial pressure is fairly clear. I think we all understand the Monroe-Kelly doctrine, and we're all comfortable kind of understanding the, the concept of intracranial pressure. But by recording things in a time-lock fashion, in a time-resolute fashion, it's clear that there's a really critical time component that's lost when you simply look at hourly electronic medical record style intracranial pressure recordings. Uh, in one study of over 300 patients with minute-to-minute -minute ICP, for instance, they found that a third of increases in ICP above 20, a threshold most of us would treat, lasting 10 to 15 minutes were actually missed by hourly measurements. And that time ends up being critical. Uh, another study looking at minute-to-minute -minute ICP data found that your odds for survival decline when your ICP is at a threshold which many of us might look at and say, well, let's watch. But if you wait long enough, then you end up increasing the odds for non-survival by moving into the red zone in this particular case. The other important part of intracranial pressure is integrating it with mean arterial pressure in order to gauge your autoregulatory function. And the idea behind this is that the autoregulatory plateau uh, allows your brain to have a consistent cerebral blood flow across a range of mean arterial pressures. And that plateau narrows or becomes lost after a severe, a severe diffuse brain injury. If you were to scatter plot the intracranial pressure against the mean arterial pressure, for a normal brain with a nice autoregulatory plateau, those two should not correlate. Your input pressure should not uh, change your resistance pressure. And that correlation coefficient then, if you were to measure it or uh, calculate it mathematically would be somewhere on the order of zero or even negative. On the other hand, if you don't have a good autoregulatory function, your input pressure directly relates to your resistance pressure. The two values are correlated and you get a correlation coefficient closer to one. This correlation coefficient is termed the pressure reactivity index and ends up being a really important variable. So this optimum CPP value ends up being really critical. Uh, in a group of uh, over 300 patients with traumatic brain injury, most had autoregulatory failure, and half of non-survivors were treated at a CPP that was lower than their optimum, which ends up being a CPP that's closer to 70 to 80, whereas, again, Brain Trauma Foundation guidelines tend to recommend 60 to 70. This may be an individualizable variable. This changes over time and is different from patient to patient and ends up being really important to calculate, but isn't something that's going to be generated by your electronic medical record. In fact, you have to have uh, time-resolute data that's subsequently processed in order to generate this kind of data. Brain tissue oxygen is an important variable when talking about diffuse brain injuries, such as subarachnoid hemorrhage, where brain tissue hypoxia correlates with poor outcome, and traumatic brain injury, where brain tissue hypoxia uh, also correlates with poor outcome. And treating brain tissue oxygen uh, to improve that hypoxia may actually improve outcome. Uh, recent uh, randomized control trial data, phase two trial data, suggested that you can reduce hypoxia by treating ICP and PBTO2 together using standardized algorithms. And there's a hint that this actually may improve outcome pending uh, uh, further study. The components of brain tissue oxygen are dissolved oxygen in the bloodstream and cerebral blood flow. And so the other measure that we look at directly is that cerebral blood flow. That way I know whether or not the brain tissue oxygen is low because of a lack of flow or low because of a lack of oxygen delivery. And so the Hemodex uh, provides a cerebral blood flow measure for us. It's a thermal diffusion uh, probe that sits within the cortex about a centimeter and a half to two centimeters under the skull. Uh, 
and using a thermal field, it measures the differences in blood uh, brain temperature that uh, that occur as a result of blood flow locally. Uh, and this has been studied as well and suggests that low blood flow can correlate with the development of symptomatic vasospasm after subarachnoid hemorrhage uh, and can be used to generate autoregulatory curves or Lassen's curve uh, in patients with traumatic brain injury with autoregulatory dysfunction. The other nice thing about the Hemodex is it also generates a brain temperature and something called a K constant. And the K constant is a physical parameter that's measured uh, in any substance and it indicates the volume of essentially the, the content of water within that substance. And so pure water has a K constant of about six. Uh, we're all two thirds water and so our K constant is somewhere in the order of 4.8 to five. And so if you look at brain tissue and say, well, that's our expected brain water content and that K value begins to rise, you can infer that there's increasing water content within the brain. And that correlates with cerebral edema actually very nicely. And so you end up with a continuous monitor of cerebral, uh, cerebral edema. Finally, we use the depth EEG. And, th and this is really a critical component of our monitoring because the cortical potentials really integrate the mechanics, the flow and the pressure and the metabolism of the brain in its function. And so we really focus on cortical dysfunction in order to tie a lot of these parameters together. Uh, at its core, uh, if there's no flow, there's no function. And so uh, blood flow ends up being a very critical piece of how you interpret the EEG. Uh, I'll show you a quick example of a patient with rising uh, cerebral perfusion, or excuse me, lowering cerebral perfusion pressures and, and falling cerebral blood flow over time. And you can see on the scalp EEG alone, the loss of the faster frequencies that occur. And this, this ischemic change in the EG can also be observed even during small increases in intracranial pressure when you monitor the cortex right next to those pressure sensing devices. This is an example of an intracranial pressure that was elevated during a, a small plateau wave. The ICP got to the mid 20s, but the EEG very clearly slowed down as that perfusion pressure became inadequate to maintain blood flow and therefore function. The, uh, the cortical dysfunction that occurs in the brain after severe injury is often a reflection of metabolic supply and demand mismatch as well. Uh, intracranial EEG seizures and periodic discharges occur in a striking amount of patients, 61% uh, in one series that was recently published. And interestingly, 42% of those occurred only in the depth EEG, not in the scalp EEG at all. But their effects were systemic and significant. Uh, increases in heart rate and blood pressure and decreases in brain tissue oxygen occur with increasing periodic discharge frequency. And when we integrate all this data together, for instance, using the CNS reader uh, for, for our data, we actually see the same thing. This is a patient with a traumatic injury in whom we have one and a half hertz periodic discharges that developed in the depth electrode. And in the nearby data, you actually see an increase in intracranial pressure uh, and you see this slow uh, increase in perfusion as the brain tries to make up the metabolic demand that's being created. And in fact, looking at microdialysis data, others have found that in fact, those seizures and periodic discharges really do increase the metabolic demand of the brain. And another example of a patient with traumatic brain injury when we first started monitoring, you can actually see that the blood flow, the perfusion number on the second line from the bottom was quite low as the patient had not been adequately resuscitated. The heart rate and the blood pressure on the top indicate the, the, the degree of resuscitation that had taken place to that time. In the EEG, which is seen down at the very bottom, has these very clear polyphasic periodic discharges. So as this particular patient was resuscitated, the heart rate comes down, the blood pressure goes up, the perfusion or the cerebral blood flow goes up, and you can see the restoration of those faster frequencies. The function of the brain improves as it has the substrate it needs to meet that metabolic demand. Intracranial EG also records spreading depolarizations. Uh, these occur after brain injury and they're, they're spontaneous waves of depolarization, neurons discharging on mass like batteries. And uh, the, uh, the clinical recording of these events has only really recently become possible. And it's striking how frequent these occur. And nearly two thirds of patients with severe TBI, up to 84% of those with poor grade subarachnoid hemorrhage. And spreading depolarizations uh, will at times generate a compensatory increase in blood flow as oxygen and glucose are required to power the sodium potassium uh, ATPA's pumps necessary to restore their membrane gradients. But when you lose autoregulatory capacity, an inverse response can develop. And that creates worsening ischemia, particularly in tissue that's already at risk or functionally silent. 
uh, again, integrating all this data, this is a patient from our ICU that had a, a clear spreading depolarization that spread across the cortex, and in this case, uh, across our depth electrode. And at the same time, you can see the perfusion value increases there, the second line from the bottom, in response to the spreading depolarization. That brain tissue sensed an uh, increase in its metabolic demand, requiring an increase in the cerebral blood flow to, to meet that demand. Others have found that uh, using microdialysis, for instance, that the lactate to pyruvate ratio increases with spreading depolarization burden. And when you time lock the spreading depolarizations, there are increases both in lactate and decreases in glucose that makes this case. And the more metabolic demand that's unmet, the, uh, the more likely it is that that tissue will become ischemic as the depolarization becomes prolonged. Uh, this is another example of a patient with a traumatic brain injury with a strip electrode, in this case, placed over the cortical surface. And the spreading depolarizations occur as that contusion that's underlying it uh, become ischemic. If you subscribe to the theory that delayed cerebral ischemia is a result of the mismatch of metabolic supply and demand, it would make sense that spreading depolarizations also occur in association with delayed of cerebral ischemia. And in fact, we actually see this as well. This is a patient with a poor grade subarachnoid hemorrhage uh, who underwent a complex clipping and ECIC bypass surgery. And we noticed by the time he got to post bleed day six, there were an increase in this uh, spreading depolarizations that began uh, 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 being observed over the surface of his cortex on an ECOG strip that was placed during the surgery. And interestingly, those spreading depolarizations occurred at a time in which the transcranial dopplers were fairly normal, but he developed symptoms on post-bleed day seven requiring angiography and craniectomy. And it was only on post-bleed day eight that we saw the transcranial dopplers increase. And this has been observed in other series as well. The spreading depolarizations really are the, the first event that begins occurring, increasing the metabolic demand of the tissue prior to the transcranial doppler changes associated with vasospasm. The other critical piece of, of integrating EEG into multimodality monitoring is that the EEG, particularly the scalp EEG, uh, is able to record or uh, report network dysfunction. The EEG, of course, is modulated by uh, interneurons, nearby neurons, networked regions, subcortical neurons, including those from the brainstem and the thalamus. And so uh, normal uh, rhythms such as the posterior dominant rhythm and sleep transients that occur during stage two sleep uh, are critical to recognize in patients with severe brain injury as they correlate with outcome. In patients with moderate to severe TBI, the odds for poor outcome go up as those elements are missing, and the same has been described in subarachnoid hemorrhage. Finally, we want to look at midbrain dysfunction as this is a critical piece of, uh, of patients with severe brain injuries, and we do that through the use of a pupillometer uh, in order to quantify the midbrain function through its uh, impact on the pupillary responses to light. And so by way of example, this was a, a patient with a traumatic brain injury who underwent an urgent evacuation of a hematoma. The skull was replaced and we put in our intracranial monitoring devices. And the first day that this patient was being monitored, you can see on the top line there, the intracranial pressure was normal, it's 10 to 16. And the neuropupillary index, which is a derived index from zero to five, with zero being an unreactive pupil and five being a normal pupil, the neuropupillary index was somewhere in the fours, which is normal. By the next day, something had changed though. The intracranial pressure had gone up, not especially high, uh, up to approximately 16 to 18. But the right pupil, you can see, begins to become more sluggish as that neuropupillary index declines. And in fact, there was increasing cerebral edema and midbrain pressure that required a decompression. And as soon as the decompression was done, the intracranial pressure dropped, but the pupil responded in a, a, a positive way over the next coming days. And so using uh, quantified pupillometry and integrating that with your multimodality data, you can really begin to understand what's happening within the brain, not just at the cortical surface, but deep down in the midbrain. So in this segment, I want to talk about integrating multimodality data. Now that you've got all this data coming into your bedside monitors and coming into your server so you can review it remotely, how do you actually interact with this data? And there's two facets to this. One is bedside integration. And this is really critical for your trainees, for your advanced practice practitioners, for your overnight uh, attendings, for those who are going to be looking at this data and beginning to make uh, management decisions. And it's critically important for the nurses who are at the bedside to understand when things have changed or when there's a problem that needs to be uh, addressed as well. So what we've uh, done here in Cincinnati is we've kind of set aside a, a list of things that we want to look for. And 
that gets passed along to the clinical team such that they're able to recognize when things have changed in a negative way. And instead of approaching things algorithmically, which is not unreasonable when it comes to thinking about intracranial pressure or brain tissue oxygen, we really invite people to think critically about what they're seeing. If the intracranial pressure is up, maybe it's simply a matter of their CPP is too low and they vasodilated, but maybe it's uh, an issue where they have uh, an increase in uh, cerebral blood flow related to hyperemia, or maybe it's an issue with uh, something else that needs to be considered. And so we actually kind of use the, um, uh, we, we use a list of things that uh, people should be thinking about in order to address real time at bedside in a responsive way. And so uh, if someone feels like perhaps there's a, a problem with peripheral oxygenation, they can address that issue and in real time see the response there at the bedside and even uh, use annotations there available on the bedside CNS monitor to address exactly what's happened and whether it worked or not. And that allows them the flexibility of moving on to different solutions and, and trying out different ways of treating the problem that they've identified. The second aspect of integrating multimodality monitoring, though, besides uh, annotating and, and responsively correcting physiologic derangements there at the bedside, is integrating this stuff into the EMR in a standardized way that can not only be used by the clinical teams to guide care, but can also be used to, to make inferences about the physiology that we're seeing in these patients with severe injuries. And the model that I use here, I'm a neurophysiologist by training, and so the model I use here is that of EG. And so uh, if you think about EG, point of care EG is a really critical skill for a neurointensivist to, to know and to comprehensively interpret, but you have to have a reader who's an expert at the EG to, to look through and identify artifacts and to, to make longer term inferences about what's happening with that patient's 24 hour recording. And EG is of course this, uh, you know, gigantic multivariate time series, time resolute data stream that someone has to look through for a full 24 hours and then report in a standardized fashion. That's exactly what we're doing with multimodality monitoring. And so uh, what we do now for EG is the machine records the data, that data is archived in various proprietary formats into a server system. And then an expert reader takes a look at the EG, looks at every second of the EG, and then records that, again, in a standardized way, in a way that's recognized by every single reader um, and done in the same way, and that's put into the medical record system. So we adopted the same strategy. By using the CNS monitor, we've integrated our intracranial data, our Philips uh, ICU uh, monitoring data, and our EG data. And that data gets stored in a uh, common format. In our case, we use MATLAB in order to integrate across uh, multiple different colleges here for research and other centers for, for other reasons. That gets integrated into a server. And that server is also available remotely for clinical care, where, again, an expert clinician takes a look at the raw data, looks at every second of it. And our goal was to generate a standardized, uh, a standardized approach to reviewing that data. And this is what it looks like. It's comprehensive. It goes through each modality. It really focuses on what are the uh, interrelations between those modalities. And at the end, there should be an interpretation and a recommendation for the clinical team. And what might that look like? So in many cases, we'll say something like this patient exhibits a pressure-dependent cerebral edema with autoregulatory dysfunction, with perfusion pressure-dependent brain oxygenation, and oligemia. Uh, this is an example of what we might report. We'll say there's cortical subcortical brain dysfunction and cortical dysfunction with the development of periodic discharges. There appears to be a relatively increased metabolic demand relative to the cortical dysfunction, the oligemia, and the need for an adequate CPP to maintain brain oxygen. And that's the kind of thing that gives your team the understanding about what's happening to that patient's physiology. Now they know we've got to keep the pressure up. We've got to reduce metabolic demand, and we'd like to see what happens maybe to these periodic discharges over time if we try to treat them and, and reduce their burden. Uh, and so by doing so, we're really able to integrate things in a systematic way for each patient that gets monitored. Uh, teams know what to expect, and they begin to make inferences about how to treat those patients. So how are all these things integrated? Well, that's a bit of a work in progress. As we begin to get more complete data, the next step is to begin looking at the physiologic data, really in clusters as a whole. Uh, patients end up being unique, and their physiology acts like a fingerprint for a given injury pattern. Uh, I'll show you a couple of examples from some literature that Dr. Balu actually mentioned in his talk as well. One is from a study of 23 patients who had traumatic brain injury. And the physiologic variables that were recorded clustered patients into individual groups. 
these states are also dynamic. And in the second figure there on the right, uh, there's 17 patients in whom that physiology was clustered into states that actually changed over time. These physiologic targets, they're dynamic, they're multivariate. And the, the core thresholds discussed here form the foundation to begin adjusting parameters for our individual patients. As humans, though, we're limited at processing these variables, but we're very much needed to guide the modules that will leverage the principles of predictive analytics to form precision medicine targets, while the feature extraction tools that we develop will enhance our ability to include summative data in the EMR for integration and to develop the modules that we can implement and validate clinically to predict patient events that we feel as clinicians are important. Uh, further, by using common data formats to store all this data, we can start to generate larger, more powerful data sets across centers to start understanding the pathophysiology that we're seeing and how best to address it. For now, though, the future is here. You get to define your elephant. It's important to understand the pathophysiology of your patient as it develops in real time, to detect secondary brain injury, and to tailor the management of your patient right now to specific physiologic goals and to begin making inferences using a standardized way of looking at that data about how best to manage uh, those folks with acute severe brain injuries that you see. Thanks, Brandon. As we mentioned in our previous webinar and now with Dr. Foreman's presentation, it becomes obvious that multimodal monitoring can provide the foundation for a new medical record for the brain. Go to our website and look for the little fist, click on it and watch our short movie called Revolution. We're collaborating with Dr. Foreman and uh, with a large group of investigators to make this new record a reality. This is uncharted territory and a tremendous research opportunity for you young neurointensivists. At this point, please get your questions in so we can review them prior to the Q&A session, which will start in two to three minutes. We'll move on to our featured industry partner, Raumedic. Most of you know Raumedic. You may not know that they are a large German plastics manufacturer with a smaller division that makes some cool oxygen monitoring products. The Raumedic catheter uses fiber optics and measures ICP, temperature, and oxygen partial pressure. Here's how the probe works. I'll, I'll try to explain this in simple terms. The probe has a luminescent agent in the tip that gets excited with light. The excited lumophores go to a party. If the party's boring with no oxygen present, they lose their excitement and this is detected by the probe as shown in the diagram. But if there's some cute little oxygen molecules at the party, the two vanish undetected to get rid of their excitement elsewhere and nothing is transmitted back to the probe. So the probe can detect how much oxygen is in the tissue by how much excitement it picks up or doesn't pick up. At least that's the way I understand it. However, contact Raumedic for the, for the real story. This slide shows more of the specs on the catheter, which you can see on the Raumedic website. So check it out. However, what's new, at least in the US market, is the ability of the MPR2 log O data logger. That's a mouthful. This, this model has a digital output as opposed to the earlier model that had an analog output. And, and because of that, it could connect directly to our CNS monitor. This interface and other features will be available in our software release coming out next month. This release is free to customers with a service agreement. So if you don't have a service agreement, get one. See us about it. So more information on all this can be found on our website, www.moberg.com. So once again, please send in your questions for Dr. Foreman. We'll now go live to beautiful downtown Cincinnati with Dr. Foreman. Hi, everybody. Good to see you guys. Dick, thanks for having me on. I really appreciate it. Uh, hopefully uh, everyone can hear me okay. I'm not seeing any comments otherwise. Um, so why don't I just dive right into some of the questions that, uh, that have been asked. Um, so I'll start with uh, I'll start with the first one on here, which is how do you get data from different monitors into the same system? And 
that ends up being a little bit of a challenge for those of you who do this. You probably recognize that each different device has its own proprietary format, it has its own way of getting that data from the device, um, and it can be a real challenge. There's a couple of methods out there to, to do that. Um, and so what we use at our shop anyway is, is the, the CNS uh, monitor. Um, and the component neuro monitoring system comes with the cabling that's been built and designed specifically to take that data out of the monitors that we use and to put it into the into the CNS uh, device itself. And that allows us to have a bedside display, which is part of the reason why we wanted to do that, uh, use that device, it gives us a bedside display that we can interact with in a little bit of a different way rather than simply archiving the data. Um, so that's that's how we end up getting it from different monitors, but it's uh, it's variable depending on where you go and what equipment you have as to what options might be available. Um, let's go to so a question from uh, Masum Desai is interesting work on cortical spreading to polarizations. How do you approach it as a therapeutic target? Um, that's a really interesting question. Uh, there are you know, there is some evidence that medications such as ketamine, for instance, may help reduce the burden of spreading to polarizations when that burden is particularly high. Um, one small series um, that we know of has kind of started to demonstrate this data, and I think there's some space for that to develop. Um, you know, right now we primarily use it as a monitoring tool such that it gives us that warning that something is occurring and that we need to track down what's happening. Um, as a therapeutic target itself, I think that science is going to be upcoming, uh, hopefully, you know, in the very near future. Um, another question is, uh, how many patients do you monitor on a regular basis? And does it take a long time to review all this data? So we, uh, you know, it's going to be different everywhere. We primarily focus on our severe traumatic brain injury patients, and we end up averaging about two per month but as those of you who are in places that have trauma know it comes in fits and spurts. So we may have two or three people uh, on at the same time, or we may have no one for a month. It just kind of depends. Um, but usually on average, it's about two folks a month. Um, the readings, that are, the reports that we do take on average 45 minutes to an hour per report, which encompasses 24 hours worth of data. Um, and that's each essentially each morning, uh, and then there's usually an afternoon read, uh, so to speak, where we go through and take a look at the data and make sure that the recommendations are still what we made that morning. Uh, and then iteratively throughout the, the evening, we might take a peek depending on what's happening. And of course, the folks in the unit who are actively managing the patient are looking at data uh, right there at the bedside. So it, it acts in a lot of ways like EEG that way. There's a, a dedicated reading period, a reporting period that takes a little while to generate and develop, and then subsequent days becomes a little more efficient. Um, another question is, uh, what are the best places for training future neurointensivists in neuromonitoring, and what are the opportunities that trainees should look towards? Um, that's a really good question. So th this is all kind of burgeoning in a lot of ways. I think the um, you know the places that do this kind of monitoring, a lot of times that just having that experience of being around this kind of neuromonitoring is um, often the best training. And so places like Columbia uh, here in Cincinnati, um, UCLA, places that do a lot of intracranial monitoring, and then there's a variety of other ones certainly uh, that, that we work with kind of all across the country, um, Penn, Mass General, uh, you, you name it. There's a lot of the bigger places uh, that have kind of larger academic fellowships uh, tend to have neuromonitoring. And so, you know, finding that place that has the patient demographic you're interested in, it has the devices maybe you have an interest in, or that simply do this kind of monitoring on a regular basis is is really this kind of the, the optimum training at this at this moment. There's nothing that's programmatic yet. There's nothing that's been uh, systematically developed in terms of uh, learning neuromonitoring. And I think that's something that probably just needs to be developed. And that's what I'm hoping, you know, over the next year or two, uh, societies like the Neurocritical Care Societies, places like uh, ourselves and Penn who've worked uh, together on some of this, can begin to get together and get consensus on uh, how to do this, how to do this in the same way across different places. Uh, and that's really going to facilitate, I think, more of a, a structured training. Um, 
so uh, you know, I think trainees should should really just look for those opportunities where they can get their hands dirty and really look at and play with this kind of data, get hands-on experience with manipulating these variables in patients who need that kind of help and uh, where they can really make a difference. Um, let's see. So we've got a question for how does uh, the autoregulatory index get calculated? Um, and that is uh, kind of an interesting calculation in that, you know, most of the time we deal with um, means uh, of data, we deal with mean pressure, for instance, or, um, you know, we deal with absolute values. The calculation that's done for autoregulatory, uh, whether as the autoregulatory index is, uh, it's a moving average correlation coefficient. So you actually have to have some computational power to do this. And the kind of gold standard software that comes from the shop that developed that index uh, in Cambridge is called ICM+. Plus. Um, the same kind of algorithm uh, has been deployed, for instance, as an add-on uh, in the CNS reader, which is the, the um, uh, remote app that's, that can be used to, to look at data that's recorded through the CNS monitor. And so you can actually see the PRX time series in, in that way. Um, and there's, uh, in, in some cases, you can even generate your own code using the, the published work that's been done by the, the Cambridge folks. So, uh, you know, in our case, we have a PRX or an autoregulatory index that comes from the, uh, the CNS reader. Um, a lot of folks I know use ICM Plus, uh, again, which is kind of the, the gold standard for that calculation. Um, it's uh, it does take a little bit of work though to do, and I think that's it's been a limiting thing. But it's it's a really important index, and if you can use that to generate your CPP opt, your optimum CPP ends up being a really useful target that I think the clinical teams sort of understand and get intuitively, um, and and that can be really powerful and change to some degree what you're doing with a specific patient. All right. Um, I've got a question, is your quad bolt a local product? Uh, it is not actually. So the quad lumen uh, bolt is produced by the Hemodex company. That's the company that makes the Bowman perfusion monitor, the cerebral blood flow monitor that I mentioned. Um, so that's, uh, that's available through that company. Um, there are a couple of companies that make bolts. Um, the quad lumen is the one we chose because we wanted to be able to put in a couple of different probes and wanted to make sure they fit and the, the rheumatic probe ends up being a touch bigger than the Lycox for instance and some of the other ones we use. Um, there is a fourth port uh, as well that's um, used for microdialysis uh, and I didn't show much data on that but um, you know, that's it's, uh, one of the reasons why we went with that. There are triple lumen bolts, uh, dual lumen bolts, single lumen bolts, what kind of whatever you, whatever you use through companies like uh, Camino and, and Hemodex, or uh, excuse me, Integra and, and Hemodex. All right, we've got a question. What is your thought about uh, the comparison between Lycox and Rometic? That's a really good question. So uh, there is uh, some data out there, which is kind of nice to look at, um, but it's variable in terms of what it shows. But essentially, in pure oxygen, they both respond almost exactly the same um, in terms of their responsiveness, in terms of their absolute values. Uh, we use, for instance, the same thresholds that are used for the Lycox to manage our patients. So a threshold of under 20 millimeters of mercury would be considered a, a dangerous threshold. And we try to address those, uh, uh, those abnormalities. And so uh, we, we view them, practically speaking, as the same. There is some in vivo data that suggests that the raw medic uh, may have a little bit of a difference in terms of its absolute value compared to the Lycox, but that it responds, depending on what you read, slower or faster in terms of changes. I think in our experience, what we've noticed is the brain pathology matters. And so the response in subarachnoid hemorrhage patients and in traumatic brain injury patients ends up being a little bit different. And I think that's a function of the injury. But uh, in, in my experience with Lycox has been largely in subarachnoid hemorrhage patients and rheumatic has been largely in trauma patients. So uh, some of those differences are uh, uh, kind of hard for me to tease apart. Um, we use similar thresholds for doing FiO2 challenges as we do for the Lycox also, um, by which we 
we can do an FiO2 challenge, increasing the FiO2 on our ventilator on a severe TBI patient, for instance, temporarily to 100% and seeing the response on the raw medic. And we look for a similar response as we would for uh, to the Lycox, which is an increase of, of some threshold. We use 10 millimeters of mercury over five to 10 minutes. And then if that's responsive, we consider that the raw medic to be working well. And so so it's very similar um, for practical purposes, even though there are some differences in the literature. All right, any other questions? Pop them on your Q&A screen there down at the bottom. Anything you like. All right. Well, without any further questions, uh, Dick, I'm going to turn it over to you. Thank you for having me. This has been great. And thank you guys for your questions. Um, look forward to hearing your experience uh, at a meeting or a conference uh, soon. Thank you guys very much. Thank you, Brandon. That was, uh, that was really wonderful. And let's uh, just continue here a minute. These are our legal disclaimers. And there they are. So I'd like to thank all of you for your participation in our webinar. A recording of this webinar will be available on our website within a week. If you have suggestions for topics relative to neurocritical care monitoring, please get in touch with us at info at So thanks again to Brandon for a wonderful presentation. And thanks to all our listeners. And we'll see you at our next webinar. The date and topic will be posted on our website. Thank you very much.